well behaved we are. I show up and you're all here. Um, so people are running up from the bathroom, so I'm going to riff for a couple of moments. Um, I still have two pairs of glasses. <laughs> if you don't pick up the sunglasses, I don't own a pair. I'm stealing them. Um, She brought me an iced coffee today, just totally out of the kindness of her heart, so that was a fair trade. Um, uh, oh, and if anybody was at the dance dramaturgy uh, event last night and picked up a errant blue scarf left on a chair, would you let me know? Um, because I know to whom it belongs. Uh, a wise man once said, how do I love thee, let me count the ways. I am thrilled to turn this over to Brian um, and a bunch of people who are going to share their love for Mark Bly and the projects that he helped make possible. Enjoy. Th thank you very much, Beth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Mark Bly, just, this is Mark Bly, if you don't know. Um, Mark Bly just leaned over to me and said, um, he lost sunglasses at the TCG conference last week, so if anyone was there and picked them up, that would be very welcome. Um, uh, my name is Brian Quirt. I'm the artistic director of Night Swimming, a dramaturgical company based in Toronto, uh, and also the director of the Banff Center Playwrights Colony in uh, Banff, Alberta. Thank you very much. Um, I also had the, I had the pleasure of being um, serving as LMDA president uh, uh, not quite as long ago as Liz Engelman, but almost. I succeeded uh, Liz, with, um, and it was a great pleasure to do so. Um, and I, so I too wanted to just take a moment to, to, to reminisce briefly on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of LMDA here uh, in New York. Um, my first conference was in 1993. Uh, Didi Kugler um, uh, had mentioned LMDA to me a year or two before, and I was able to attend in 93 in Montreal, uh, the first and only conference so far in Montreal. Thank you. Um, and uh, the, um, a couple snapshots from my uh, time at LMDA. Uh, there's two from pre-conference, and one of them was going to be the dead body story in Tacoma. Uh, and I feel a bit ripped off that Jeff got to it first. Um, uh, my memory of it uh, as a Canadian was a little different. It was a lot funnier than Jeff's version, but um, uh, it was a great start to the conference. Really hasn't been beaten since. Um, and the, uh, the other ver uh, moment from pre-presidential e era in my world was um, in 1996 in Toronto. Uh, we had a conference downtown in Ryerson, and on the final day, we all met, all the Canadians met after the conference, and I've told this story a couple times, but it was seminal, where we got together and talked about what the repercussions of having the conference in Toronto might be for us in Canada. And we talked about it out on the front steps of the university, and uh, at some point, someone said, you know, what about a, a, a newsletter in Canada and, 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 you know, is anyone interested in doing it? And I put up my hand and here I am 19 years later um, uh, and I can't say that there really has been um, any downside to putting up my hand like that. I want to thank everyone who said, uh, you put your hand up, get to work. Um, the other thing I had a pleasure of doing a couple times with Liz and then with a group of other artists, including Mark and uh, Vanessa Porteous and uh, Madeline Oldham, um, was representing LMDA in the UK uh, around the beginning of the Dramaturgs Network there and, uh, and collaborating with them and also representing the organization in Mexico on a delegation um, to a festival in Mexico City. Um, and I guess my point about that is that L LMDA has continually opened doors for me, um, not only here in the US, amongst my colleagues in Canada, uh, but internationally as well. And I think the message there is that LMDA can serve you just as much as you can serve LMDA. The, the machine works both ways, uh, and it can really contribute substantially to what you want to achieve in your work if you want to make that happen. Um, I had the pleasure of running two conferences, one in Toronto and then um, uh, one in San Diego, and two memories there. One is a beautiful bonfire that concluded the Toronto conference. Uh, on Toronto Island on the beach with a drumming circle uh, uh, on the final night. And I guess the thing that I most remember about that is the kind of pure beauty of a group of artists coming together for talking for three days and concluding with this kind of fantastic, magical, astonishing, um, alive, fire-driven event um, that uh, was vivid and wordless. And for a group of people that talks relentlessly, uh, concluding with a wordless event I thought was, uh, uh, worked beautifully. 
Um, and then the other one a year later in San Diego was um, at our final banquet. I think Shelley referenced it in her reminiscences of um, uh, where I, I think I managed to make fun of, of way too many American things, including Oscar Brockett, and uh, uh, who I, for whom I apologize. Um, and then the final thing is, we've done a lot of meetings in, in, in Louisville at the Humana Festival the, for the board. And um, so my final reminiscence uh, involves bourbon. Um, and substantial amounts of it uh, consumed with Daniel Carroll, our administrative director, uh, Paul Walsh, um, and on a separate trip out into the Bourbon Trail, um, Vicki Stroich and Bob White. Um, so as a Canadian, and as a Canadian who is a huge fan of the conference bar, um, the Bourbon experiences in Humana uh, have been a, a sort of a salient and uh, ongoing uh, attraction to this organization. My point ultimately is that it's the personal and the professional pleasure and laughter and colleagues that I have engaged with over the last 20-something years in many countries that have provided a, a platform um, for my ideas and, and a place for me to become the artist and the dramaturg that I have become. And I want to thank Ellen D.A. and all of you for contributing so much to all of those experiences. Um, more recently, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Mark and a really talented group of people on the Bly Creative Capacity Grants. And I'm going to shift this over to our esteemed panel now. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, allow them uh, in a moment to speak um, to the larger issues and then to the specifics of the uh, projects that they have initiated through this program. Um, I think this is a program and a, and a creation and a granting idea that really does move us and was designed to move the field forward. Um, today we're going to talk about two things, two types of process. One, um, the actual lie grant um, process itself, and I'll be asking Mark to speak um, about his impetus to create it um, and how it's progressed from his point of view over the last year since we gave our first grants, and also the process in action of the four um, projects that received funding um, last fall. Um, personally, I want to thank, of course, Mark for the generosity and the insight uh, that he has brought to um, driving this to its uh, fruition, and then to the committee. Indeed. And then also to the committee that uh, helped create it and uh, adjudicate it last fall, um, along with myself, Beth Blickers, Liz Engelman, Jeff Prohl, um, Cindy Sorrell, and Vicki Stroich. Thank all of you for your labors. Um, there are details about the program in your conference package, so please have a look at that. Uh, the de next deadline is September 15th. Um, in 2014, we had more than 60 applications requesting more than $870,000 in grants, uh, which showed us that the need is there, the desire is there, the projects are there. Um, it has helped drive membership because membership is a requirement of applying, so it has been beneficial to um, LMDA as a whole in a very immediate way there. Um, and even more importantly, it, it showed us who's doing what out there. And there were many projects that, that um, some or all of us were, had not been aware of prior to this. And while obviously we were only able to offer four grants, the knowledge that uh, entered LMDA through the adjudication of the program uh, I thought was fantastic and, and hugely valuable in and of itself. Um, we made four grants and we've invited the leaders of those projects here to speak about their projects. Um, and I'm going to just take a moment and ask them um, to introduce themselves. If Philippa Kelly, California Shakespeare Theatre. Uh, Lydia Garcia, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Cotalin Trenchini, dramaturg from London. And I just want to say thank you to Brian for mentioning the Dramaturgs Network because as co-founder and former president of the Dramaturgs Network, I'm very, very proud of the relationship between the Dramaturgs Network and the LMDA, and I hope that it will continue to grow in the next three, two years. Absolutely, thank you. Janice Perrin, dramaturg for Memory Rings. Jessica Grindstaff for Phantom Limb Company, director of Memory Rings. Heidi Taylor, Artistic and Executive Director at Playwrights Theatre Centre. Uh, Jan Derbyshire, Playwright, Dramaturg, uh, Director with uh, PTC for this project. And uh, I'm Mark Bly, uh, who's uh, endured and <laughs> but with uh, great, 
great, uh, let's put it very simply, I've had a, a lifelong love affair with LMDA. Thank you, Mark. Um, before I ask them each to talk uh, in detail about the actual project that they're engaged with right now, um, I wanted each of our um, teams or individuals to speak to, to one of the larger issues that each of their programs um, addresses. And um, part of what was beautiful about how these played out for me, for us at least, uh, is that they've, they've landed on, on four really key, very vital, very important topics that we've discussed uh, in dramaturgical circles and indeed at this conference. Um, inclusion, uh, multidisciplinary creation, uh, diversity, and uh, dance dramaturgy. Um, so I'm asking each group um, for a, a, a quick three-minute snapshot of the landscape in each of those areas um, and the impetus that they had to, to initiate the project. And then uh, once we go through that, um, I'm going to ask Mark to speak, and then we'll move on to a more detailed uh, um, observation about where each of the projects is or what they are and, and, and how they're functioning at the moment. So. Um, if I may, I'd like to begin with um, Lydia and Philippa uh, and ask you to speak, um, and I know we've talked about this, but I think it, it pays, it always pays to continue the discussion, but um, the, uh, the state of diversity and what drove you to enact your project. Um, so I'm Philippa Kelly and um, it's a great honour to be here and to have your faith in us. Um, so both Lydia and I um, are from companies that are in different phases of developing diversity as a company-wide model. And uh, basically last year when, when I saw the, the Bly Awards um, advertised, I phoned Lydia and said, I think this is something that we should really work on together because we are at these different phases. We have different forms of um, specialization, different forms of, of um, particular um, tools that we can blend um, and, and have worked together. So um, we started to think, what is diversity and inclusion and how does it work practically in the theatre for dramaturgs? So what tools can we set up? So we had this idea that we would produce a handbook and it will be about pointing out the questions that dramaturgs might want to ask, opportunities for dramaturgs to explore, um, rather than providing a how-to, um, how to make your dramaturgy diverse. But I think the questions, and, and we'll also have some case studies, very short snapshots of um, models that could be useful. More later, but on to Lydia. Thanks, Philippa. Uh, absolutely. When, uh, when, when Philippa first called me with this idea, uh, actually, Philippa was already in conversation with Carmen Morgan, who I believe many of you might have already encountered either, the, either at TCG as part of their Diversity uh, and Inclusion Institute, um, but also, you know, because she is a, a national leader in the conversation around issues of diversity, inclusion, and equity in the American theater. Um, and about helping us progress the conversation to a point where uh, we move beyond diversity. Uh, to talk about inclusion, which is a very different thing. Uh, you know, at OSF, we talk about how diversity is a given. This is a diverse country. This is a diverse world. But inclusion is active. Uh, it has to be created, it has to be fostered, and it has to be maintained. And so how, how do we, as arts institutions, uh, create the, the environment in which inclusion is not only possible, but it is desirable for our survival as an art form? Um, and, so, uh, and so I was very excited for this opportunity. Um, OSF has been blessed with uh, having artistic directors uh, who in, in, in their own way have been trying to open the door to having the conversation about artistic representation, about cultural authenticity, about uh, not propagating problematic narratives uh, on the stage um, in, in over the years with, with various levels of success. Um, and we find that even with the best of intentions, with uh, even you know, our growing awareness of how unconscious and conscious biases work upon us as people, we still found that even with the best of intentions, we were putting uh, work on the stage that would, we would realize afterwards, oh, I think we fell into that trap. 
Um, and so how, how do we as artists, first of all, translate the conversation about diversity, inclusion, and equity, about social justice uh, into art? To find the terminology, to define the concepts, to, uh, to offer, I, I, don't, I don't even want to call it advice because I, I think one of the things that we're, that we're really starting to uncover as we try and feel out the edges of the, the, the situation as we're trying to define it is that it's actually much bigger and with every rock that we pull up, we uncover something else. Um, there's a danger in believing that we have answers to offer. And instead, uh, I, I think we both hope that this is uh, a, a, a platform for conversation. Um, and this is a conversation that we want to have with you uh, because you are all artists in your own uh, situations, in your own environments, and the questions that you have might be different from what we as resident dramaturgs at large institutions might be facing. Um, so, you know, as Philippa shared, I think that like the idea of, of case studies, much like how a business school, for example, would look at uh, situations in various enterprises with uh, certain individuals, uh, things that happen with audiences, things that happen with guest artists working at regional theaters, uh, conversations around kinds of plays and what makes a good play. Let me tell you how loaded that is. Um, and for, and for you know, us as dramaturgs who, uh, let's face it folks, like, uh, objectivity is an illusion. We walk into a rehearsal room with the people that we are. And so how do, how do our identities um, foster or hold back the conversation, I think, is something that uh, that is valuable for us to engage in uh, as artists together in the field. Great, thank you very much, both of you. Um, I'm going to move on, if we could, to Catalan, and if you could, uh, uh, whose project is around dance dramaturgy, and if you could speak um, sort of an opening statement about dance dramaturgy and your sense of its importance. And okay, yeah. Um, well. The point I want to make, uh, first of all, is that dance dramaturgy is not a European import to North America. <laughs> the role of the dance dramaturg evolved simultaneously and around the same time over here as it happened in Europe. The development of the role of the dance dramaturg in the Americas emerged from the seismic cultural shift that took place in the 1960s and gained momentum in New York City, San Francisco and other urban centers and spread across the nation. One of the New York City hubs of the, uh, this artistic revolution was the Judson Dance Theatre, the birthplace of postmodern dance. The birth of dance dramaturgy in the United States can be located near the origin of these collaborative interdisciplinary processes. The history of the emergence of the dance dramaturg's role in America originates from collaborative processes and cross art forms. Dance dramaturgy and the new role of the dance dramaturg appears to have grown from the meeting of theater, dance, and other art forms, and of those cross-genre or site-specific performances where physicality and theatricality were brought together, their possibilities were further explored, and the borders of theater, dance, and visual art were blurred. I also think that the artists working at Judson Dance Theater discovered collab uh, collective dramaturgy well before the term was coined. Their work has influenced the way today's dance dramaturgs in America think and work. And it's not only that the group's work changed the landscape of contemporary dance, its aesthetics and its dramaturgy, but also that there were two relationships within the group that can be considered dramaturgical. And I just want to quickly refer to Cunningham and Cage's relationship, and also critic Jill Johnstone's, uh, Johnstone's work, who reviewed Johns Judson from the inside as a participant or observer of the work being made. And I can't think of, uh, can't help thinking of Lessing's very, very uh, similar role of being the inside uh, uh, a critic brought into the process and reviewing and, and reflecting on the work from within uh, the, uh, the, the company. Uh, in Canada, albeit two decades later, the job of the dance dramaturg was forming too, with the driving force behind it being the Toronto Independent Dance Enterprise. And uh, the collective invited artists to work with them, and one of them was Didi Kugler. And, uh, uh, whose work with TIDE in 1986 and 7 was some of the early, earliest work by a dramaturg uh, in dance in Canada. And 
alongside uh, the ones already mentioned today, there are established dramaturgs who have contributed hugely to dance dramaturgy in North America. And we've got some of them sitting here. Mark Lord, we've got Elizabeth Langley, Catherine Profeta, Jack Jacob Zimmer. Um, so there is a very, very rich tradition of dance dramaturgy in, in America. Uh, there are many choreographers, Jack Fever, Doug Elkins, Dean Moss, uh, Ralph Lemon working with, with dramaturgs. Uh, with one dance dramaturgy conference held in Toronto and York in 2011, and two forthcoming books on the subject written or edited by North American authors, and I'm thinking of Phil Hansen and Darcy Callinson's edited volume that's uh, coming out soon, Dance Dramaturgy, Modes of Agency, Awareness and Engagement, and the other is Catherine Profeta's monograph that's coming out later this year, uh, Dramaturgy in Motion. Uh, North America is in the forefront on the discourse on dance dramaturgy. Uh, just briefly about my project, the importance of my project is, and my research is, to, to build on this knowledge and help disseminate ideas and practices as well as contribute to the further development of the vocabulary of dance dramaturgy. And I will talk about it later. Great, thank you very much. Um, if you could pass the mic along, uh, and Janice and Jessica, uh, if I could ask you to, to speak to um, um, multidisciplinary dramaturgy, which uh, your project lives inside, and yeah. I think we're the only uh, project here that's actually uh, very specifically performance-oriented, the uh, creation of work around a specific project that is Jessica Grindstaff's brainchild. Um, I am actually here as a former uh, recovering, completely text-based dramaturg, uh, who in recent years have moved, uh, I've moved more and more into multidisciplinary uh, work. So I don't have an overview of the leading figures in uh, multidisciplinary dramaturg in the Americas over the past decades. I only have insight uh, into my own emergence into that field uh, over the past several years. Uh, I spent many years as the director of play development uh, at the McCarter Theater in Princeton and subsequently as uh, a program, uh, senior program associate and senior dramaturg for the Sundance Theater Program where I still work. But since leaving the institutional theater in 2005, um, Partly by hook and by crook, and partly by luck and inclination, my work as a freelance dramaturg began taking me uh, into realms that were more or less previously unknown to me, although I had worked uh, in musical theater work uh, as a dramaturg at Sundance, McCarter, and elsewhere. Um, so for me, this has actually been a, a wonderful experience, a kind of expansion of horizons uh, in my work as a dramaturg with obvious uh, links to the kind of inquiry that I've always been interested in, specifically from a sort of structural and organizational point of view. Um, that's a bias I have, in, I guess, in, in all the work um, that I take on. But I think it's been uh, a, an interesting development in my own work that the past uh, few years have seen me begin to move into the realm of dance dramaturgy. Uh, as well as uh, my first opera, uh, and now with Phantom Limb in a hugely collaborative, uh, highly multi multidisciplinary work uh, called Memory Rings, which, by the way, just opened in Nashville last weekend. It's the first stop uh, in what will be uh, upcoming uh, landings for that elsewhere, including uh, UCLA next April and uh, BAM in November of 2016. Um, we can talk more about methodologies, and I actually am here, I think, in a way as in uh, to speak against specialization. Um, one of the uh, comments that resonated with me in my own, it was actually it was actually Twitter. You know how Twitter, one thing leads to another, and there you are reading something um, that you didn't intend to read. Um, I came across a conversation actually about dra dance dramaturgy that took place in Amsterdam in 1999. Uh, 
And one of the participants in that conversation, um, perhaps known to you, a woman named Hildegard de Voist, um, said something that uh, immediately um, made her my champion. A lot of the conversation uh, was about different methodologies in dance dramaturgy and the different kinds of roles that dance dramaturgs play uh, as opposed to how they work in other disciplines. Um, and even though she's speaking specifically of dance dramaturgy, I felt that what she had to say not only uh, resonated with my work uh, in multidisciplinary work, but also just as a dramaturg in whatever I'm doing. She says, I've worked with different choreographers and directors, and I feel that it works best when I'm not really needed somehow, when I'm not the embodiment of something that is missing. Because it feels like if I'm not necessary, in fact, then I have a sort of freedom and a playground to stand on. Uh, and for me, that not knowing, that lack of expertise, <laughs> that inauthenticity um, was, has been completely freeing for me. Um, Jessica, do you want to talk a little bit about getting together um, on memory rings before we move on? Sure. Um, when I met Janice, I had a piece of paper with 12 words written on it about four of which were repeated. <laughs> and I had just finished a two-week residency where I was to write our play, and that was what I came out with, and I was so excited. And I showed it to our producer, and, um, and I had read several books and listened to lots of music and had a whole wall filled with papers and strings, and you know, it looked like a crazy person's studio. And this was the culmination of my work that I was so proud of. And, and then she said, that's great. I want to introduce you to this dramaturg, <laughs> Janice Perrin. And, um, and the next step was that we were to go to a residency, the Robert Rauschenberg Residency Program. And, and Janice came and was very quiet for the first week or so. Um, and, and actually kind of filled me with confidence over my one page, 12 word script, um, and that was the beginning of our journey, which is not concluded, but premiered, and we'll continue to work on it uh, until it opens next spring in UCLA, and, um, and I'm proud to say that we now have, I think the script is 16 pages. <laughs> it's mostly stage directions. The, the only word in the script is achoo. <laughs> Wait, What's the other line? Hello. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Who is this? So um, to me, it's been a great success, and I can't imagine ever working on another project without her. Um, and I don't know how else to speak to multidisciplinary dramaturgy, but <laughs> with that. You're living inside it. Thank you. Um, Heidi and Jan, could I ask you to speak to inclusion from your point of view and, and the state of it and the, the insta instigating moment, and then we'll come back to Mark. For Sure, thanks, Brian. Um, I'd like to uh, start just by uh, describing Playwrights Theatre Center. We are a, a theatre company, a non-producing theatre company whose mission is to find, nurture, and advance Canadian playwrights. And we do our work on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people. And it's a part of our cultural practice to always acknowledge the territory where we're working. And I, I have, uh, it's just sort of emblematic of my experience of our project. I failed to discover the precise names of the peoples whose territory we're on right now beyond the historical experience of the Algonquin people um, and further north, the uh, Iroquois people. So if anyone knows that and can shout it out, um, I'm sorry? Can you say it again? The Lenape. Thank you. So I would like to acknowledge that we're working on the territory of the Lenape people right now. Um, in Canada, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission just finished its work, which is the beginning of a very big project of work to uh, move through the reconciliation of a cultural genocide that is not has not ended in Canada. And my experience working um, and learning from Indigenous practice certainly uh, laid the groundwork for 
my understanding of how limited PTC's practice has been uh, with regard to inclusion, particularly for artists with a lived experience of disability. Um, my experience also comes from my family. Uh, my mother is uh, uh, adap adaptive phys ed professor, so adaptation and uh, relationship to experience of disability has been her life's work. And my uncle lived with cerebral palsy and I was involved in his end of life care. So I have some uh, family roots which I have discovered mean not very much in terms of my own ability to practice inclusion in my own practice. Practice, practice. Um, however, it did do something to cultivate a certain willingness to uh, come towards these questions. So uh, partly in response to a theater engagement project that I've been part of in Vancouver that has uh, as one of its pillars diversity, I was very aware that um, inclusion and the experiences of people with disabilities uh, was not a part of that conversation. And so when the Bly grants were announced, I uh, thought about what I might be able to do uh, from the platform of PTC, and I called Jan Derbyshire, who's been a uh, collaborator, a friend, a teacher to me um, for a number of years through PTC. Um, and we talked about what we might be able to do together. Um, so we came up with the ACK Lab project, a hacker approach to inclusion, and Jen will discuss what that terminology means. Um, but that's been the impetus for conversations that will lead to a process in the fall to apply creatively the discoveries that we've been making together. And um, this has been very much a process of um, of learning for myself in conversation. And I, while we were talking about what we would talk about today, I said, yes, it's been making uh, a process of making my own learning visible. And then we talked about using a different word, um, thinking about who might be in our audience, who might be listening on HowlRound. And, it's just one small example of what the conversations are that Jan and I have been having, which are about listening, um, listening to my own experience and uh, limitations, and being curious about how to shift my assumptions. So I'm hoping that by uh, engaging in this process and as we move forward, sharing that process uh, more widely, it will give other uh, practitioners access to their own process of questioning. Um, and I'd like to also acknowledge that these conversations are taking place at PTC in a space that is not accessible. So the, the process, the uh, state where we're at in Vancouver and I think in the rest of Canada is that um, we're working um, from individually ableist practices, um, that we're working from in ableist companies and within an ableist community, and that un until we um, begin to recognize that um, and understand this as a, a social justice question that we can approach through our practice, but that, that that's not the extent of what we need to do, um, I, th I think that to me is our, our beginning place, that we have a very, very long way to go. And within the resources that we have, um, this is the time to begin. Thanks, Heidi. Um, Mark, could I ask you to uh, speak to um, the impetus to create the Bly Grant and some context about your observations on the first round, and then we'll come back and hear a little bit more about the details of where each group is at right now. Well, uh, you have in the, uh, your uh, conference folder a two-page document that describes the uh, grant, the fellowship, <coughs> And I'm sure you've gone online in the, the site and everything. So you've seen details and you know how to apply for it. So I don't want to go into too much detail. 
Uh, the impetus for it, uh, some of it's personal, obviously. Uh, but I suppose the starting point in many ways, again, I said a little while ago, I have a 30-year a, a love affair with this organization. I saw a little earlier Alexis Green in the audience, who was the first president uh, of LMDA. If, if you uh, have never met her, she's right there in a red sweater. Uh, yeah. So touch royalty, if you will. <laughs> uh, but I, I bring that up in, in not a casual way. Uh, part of the impetus for it was over 30 years, and this is personal and not personal, is that with any organization, it goes through cycles. It goes through ebbs and flows. Energy flowing up, down, sideways, whatever. Uh, I've witnessed some extraordinary moments. I've witnessed some ebbs. I've witnessed uh, incredible moments where someone like Anne Catania suddenly says, we need to do this, we need to do that. What ideas do you have? And so extraordinary moments happen where the university caucus happens, the script exchange happens, dramaturgy source book happens, production notebooks happens. This man and his guidelines, for God's sakes, they're one of the most extraordinary pillars uh, of this organization, and many, many other things. Highlights, extraordinary events. And a couple years ago, and part of this, again, was personal, uh, and no one's interested in my personal life. I'm not interested anymore. Why would you be? Uh, I had moved from Texas uh, to New York, and Cindy, from Texas, Cindy Sorrell, uh, the uh, board chair. Um, I called her, I said, I want to talk with you, Cindy. And, and uh, on a day when I was walking across Manhattan, and, and, and she called me, and I was in Bryant Park, and it was loud and crazy and noisy, and birds were flying overhead. Uh, but it was a summer day. <clears throat> I could barely hear her on my smartphone. And uh, she asked what I wanted. To, and, uh, I said, um, I, I felt the organization needed some new energy. It was at that moment I felt that I felt, my interpretation, maybe totally wrong, uh, that it needed something. It needed to be propelled forward at this moment. And she said, what do you want to do? And I said, and again, this is from those of you who know me, uh, it was my own little puny personal metaphor. Uh, I want to give it artistic oxygen. And I said, I want to give it a donation. And it became the Bly Creative Capacity Grant Fellowship. And I was blessed. You know, it was easy to just exercise one's hand. Uh, it's even easy to have some ideas. Uh, to come up with a phrase, you know, on the spot. You know, she would say, what, what does this mean? And I, I came up with phrases like, uh, to give critical support to projects that address a need no one knows. That's what I said on the spot. Uh, projects that will give to others and have an impact on others and go beyond the present moment to an invisible future. I said that on the spot with all this noise in Bryant Park. Uh, but that's what I knew. That's what I understood. And, and, and that would have meant nothing except for this incredible group of people, uh, of Beth Blickers, Brian Court, Liz Engelman, Jeff Prohl, Vicki Stroyd, and others, too, who talked to me about this, uh, who drove it forward, step by step by step. And, and, this incredible Cindy Sorrell, oh my God, I mean, please give her a hand because she drove it forward. I mean, the rest of the group, including Brian and, and, and uh, Liz, who really helped on the guidelines, uh, were extraordinary. It would not have gotten 
you know, beyond the 50 yard line, the metaphorical 50 yard line without them. So uh, you, can, you can thank me for doing this exercise with my hand, but the fact is they made the difference. See, I, I, I have great people. I have great people. <laughs> what can I say? And the great thing is these applications. I'm sorry. What? Sorry. Uh, the great thing is these applications. You know, these there are 60, 61 applications. We didn't know a how many applications were going to come in. We were stunned that there were these applications, and that they were not about another line on a CV or resume. That's what was so thrilling about these applications. And uh, they had a genuine curiosity about them for staging th for events uh, for the stage and for breaking down invisible or visible events that prevent artists, staff, and audiences from expressing themselves. And that was truly moving. And I mentioned the word curiosity a second ago. And about the same time, uh, a couple years ago, two things happened, and you'll remember this. Uh, September 2012, 13, something like that, uh, Voyager 1, which had been launched in the late 70s, NASA, Carl Sagan was part of that, was sent into outer space uh, as, as an ambassador to the future, if you will, with a whole bunch of messages on, on it. And sometime or a year or two ago, it passed the heliosphere and going out of the solar system. Some scientists say it's not quite there yet, but who's debating? It's not going to reach the nearest star for 40,000 years. That's why it's a little equivocating. It's a very lonely, hopeful messenger for us. Also about the same time came out this amazing, again, connected to Sagan, television program, new version, new iteration of it, of Cosmos, led by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Getting to the point. Stay with me. DeGrasse Tyson, second or third episode, got talking about revolutionary scientists who each time they made a breakthrough, astronomers, whoever they were, 
looked around and said, how big is your universe? How big is it? And I remember hearing him say that on this PBS program. And my brain stopped and I went, yeah. How big is my dramaturgical universe? Each time I work, I've got to make it bigger. How big is the, 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 the staging, the stylistic investigation? Is it big enough? I've got to ask larger questions. Uh, is, is my dramaturgical universe taking into consideration also the societal issues as well out there? I talked about curiosity a moment ago. One of our most important traits, and this is very connected to everything that's going on with these, and I think it's why our group that selected it, a group of six people, were drawn to these. There was a great curiosity about human beings. Again, not about a CV line. It's a great curiosity about humans. And when we're curious, and when we're not curious, I should say, we begin to ignore each other. Ignoring leads to exclusion, not inclusion, which leads to a lack of empathy, which leads to hate, which can lead to violence as we've witnessed in Ferguson, in Brooklyn, and now Charleston. And whether or not you believe we are that country, we need to incite and we need to arouse with other artists curiosity through dramaturgical impulses and acts of dramaturgy. And we need to insist that other stories are told and shown. And that flag must be waved and not taken down. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to pass this back down to, the, uh, to Jan uh, to ask you to talk about the ACT Lab and uh, you know, um, a snapshot of where it's at and where you want it to get to, um, and then we'll go and get a snapshot from each of them. And I'll give you a little warning just so we can kind of keep towards our time, but thank you. Jan. Uh, thank you, and thank you, uh, Mark, and um, I've forgotten your name. We just met. Thank you. Um, I was really nervous until, um, I get nervous talking about theater when I can't sense any emotion. So um, thank you for that. Thank you for, um, part of my work involves reclaiming the full spectrum of emotion back from, um, you know, um, in the days where it used to be a good thing to have an artistic temperament. So um, <laughs> thank you for that. And, and also thank you, Mark, for this grant, for the, uh, the reminder of the value of curiosity, which is what I wanted to thank you about these grants because, um, you know, Outside of the academic framework, it allows that curiosity to stay front and center, and uh, it also takes away the pressure of having something to prove, um, which is where discoveries are, are made. So um, uh, the ACT Lab, a hacker's approach to inclusion. Um, so hackers uh, generally are associated with the computer world, and um, they generally look at a system and see that it's not working as well as it could, or it could be used for something else. They don't invent something new. They uh, look at the pieces and they talk amongst themselves and amongst people in the world. They just start conversations and they figure out how to reconfigure a system. So um, that's what we wanted to do with this whole idea of um, inclusion and diversity as it pertains to uh, persons with um, perceived or acknowledged uh, disabilities. It's kind of like a kaleidoscope. It's we don't want to throw away our expertise or our privilege or our power or our knowledge. It's a little piece that we have and we need to use it. Unfortunately, we have to get used to those pieces floating all around 
and working together to bring them into focus maybe for 10 seconds or so. So we're doing a lot of things right. We're doing a lot of things right. However, um, we need to really, I think, place this uh, lack of inclusion in terms of persons with disabilities into a proper light. And I wanted to read to you a, a, an employment call from one of the most uh, progressive theater companies that I know um, that shall remain anonymous. But I just wanted to read you the call and, and to say that they really do answer to this kind of work and this kind of uh, employment. Uh, Blank Theater is a company founded on the principle of diversity and we hope to receive applications from candidates uh, with a broad range of backgrounds, including but not limited to race, ethnicity, indigeneity, gender, gender identification, sexual orientation, class, and physical ability. In parentheses, though our office is on the second floor and not wheelchair accessible. So, why I mention the kaleidoscope is because it doesn't, uh, these conversations that I've been having with people, it, 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 there is guilt involved. There is guilt involved, but we have to start from where we are. And we have to take responsibility for the weight of what is in that parentheses. Um, we have to um, have these conversations. And what I appreciate is uh, this is not a, a condition that I'm uh, particularly comfortable in or um, at my best in. Uh, where I operate best is one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations. And so that's the form that the beginning of our work has been taken. Um, based on um, the idea that comes from inclusive design, which is just skewing our perspective slightly and beginning to think of disability as a condition and not a trait. So in that way, I can acknowledge to myself that the conditions here today um, don't allow me to be at my best, which is okay. It still allows me to be here. I can still negotiate it, but some people cannot. So these very conditions, right, are keeping uh, voices out. Um, the conversations have been starting at, you know, it's kind of uh, based on, uh, I had to uh, change my conditions of working because of a, a, a brain injury that didn't allow me to work in the same way. So I had to figure out, uh, I had to hack my own practice. I had to figure out how to, how, to, how to write again and how to talk to other people again and how to adjust working hours and how to accept that I couldn't do things the way they're supposed to be done. And um, that led me to working with artists with disabilities. And um, you know, all those conditions, all the conditions of working, uh, what inclusive design uh, also brings us is that those conditions can benefit us all if we change them. The example that they use uh, in the built environment is a curb cut. So we're all familiar with the little dip in the sidewalk that was originally designed to help people in mobility devices get around easier, be able to just cross the sidewalk where um, able-bodied people cross the sidewalk. But we've also benefited, you know, cyclists love it. Uh, people with baby carriages love it. Um, uh, any kind of wheeled device uh, loves it. So we're talking about these conditions. You know, what? Are, how can we change the conditions, um, not arbitrarily, but by working with this idea of not one size fits all, but one size fits one. So for for my particular way of communicating, this is a great way for me to get ideas across. So, so that's one. Um, change. So what we're going to do is, um, by having these conversations and recording, uh, you know, the, what we're coming up against, it's empowered me to go and uh, have other one-on-ones with artistic directors and uh, gatekeepers. We're recording all of these uh, conversations and the, the things we're coming up against. It's also going to allow us to uh, work uh, on a project called uh, One Size Fits One, where we'll be hacking the normal playwrights colony and putting people in one-to-one -one relationships, a person with a perceived or acknowledged disability and an artist who does not identify that way. Um, we're going to be uh, 
yeah, reporting back on all those conditions on an online free format, open source format called Scalar. And if you want to look at it, it's quite awesome. It's kind of for nonlinear thinkers. You can kind of go all over, which I appreciate. And also, you can follow a path, which other people I work with appreciate. So the final challenge I'd like to invite you into this project that can become, uh, you know, a, a bit of ethnography, a bit of self-study for all of us, is just to uh, commit to observing your own uh, practices of making and see if you can identify how you've made any changes or adaptations or chosen preferences that help you work better. It's just an interesting experiment to see if you could share that knowledge with others and also to make a commitment to work with a person, one person this year, with a perceived or acknowledged disability. Just one person. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jan. <laughs> Janice, can I ask you to speak to your project? And I know you just had an opening, happy opening. Um, and uh, where it's at. Right. Um, Jessica, I think you should give the sort of capsule description of what the piece is, which we haven't even, we sort of skipped over that piece. And it's so fascinating in both the, the um, subject matter and the degree of collaboration and the fact that you come from a visual art background uh, make this, I think, a, a, an unusual piece. But, but it's your brainchild, so I'd rather you describe Memory Rings. Memory Rings is second in a trilogy, and the thread through the trilogy is humans' relationship to nature and the environment. And the first one was called 69 Degrees South, and it was about, uh, started from the story of Ernest Shackleton and the Endurance Expedition and, um, in Antarctica. And my partner and I are fierce researchers, and we got a grant from the National Science Foundation to go to Antarctica to research for this piece and gather visual and audio and work with scientists there. We often work with scientists in our work. So that was number one, and we worked on it for four years. And when we finished it, we thought, what did we like about that, and what will we do next? And, and the, the uh, inquiry into how people relate to the environment, what seems to be kind of, for us, um, one of the most important conversations to be having amongst all the other conversations that are being had on the stage right now. But um, so, I can't actually remember where the anchor of this tree came in, but there is a tree in the Eastern Sierra, it's called the Methuselah, and it's almost 5,000 years old. And so we thought, well, let's look at how people's relationship to nature has changed and to the forest specifically over the past 5,000 years. And is it different or is it the same? And um, so it brought us to the epic tale of Gilgamesh, which is, I don't think I need to tell people in this room about that, but um, but a story that is is right, that was carved into stone tablets right at the same time that th this seed was germinating. So that kind of seemed like the perfect story to start with and weave through the show, and then um, and then we started to pick up some other fables and fairy tales, and um, and then have written a kind of new fable that uh, that weaves throughout the show. So. We are visual artists, and my husband's a composer, and we work with puppetry and dance and video, and we kind of just like throw a lot of tableaus and a lot of ideas together because it feels right, and we do tons of research, and we went on an expedition to find this tree, which we did. Um, but we really need, I think, someone like Janice to, um, who I would say, I mean, would almost say is a co-writer with me on the show, um, as well as our dancers, there's a lot of improvisation, our choreographer, I mean, everyone is writing. Um, and we have a lot of very strong and kind of beautiful minds in the room doing that at the same time. But someone's gotta like kind of be accountable. I mean, obviously I have to, but I'm not always doing that because I get really wrapped up in the sort of beauty of things sometimes. And so it's been really amazing to have um, almost always amazing to have this person. <laughs> Sometimes all I have to do is just look across the room and know that what we're doing isn't going to fly or is. Um, and I've just been constantly surprised by the relationship and what you brought to the piece. And you probably have more intelligence. No, 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 not at all. I, uh, just in terms of, uh, of where we are, the, the 
development of this piece has been a huge challenge, and even the dramaturgical model of how this piece has moved ahead uh, was an unusual one because uh, it's not a commission from a, a single institution. It doesn't have the backing uh, of a single uh, producing organization. So uh, it's been developed through a series of workshops and residencies uh, really put together by uh, our producer, Mar Isaacs, uh, who has been sort of single-handedly designing a way, I mean, we should also acknowledge the dramaturgy of creative producing, uh, because she has been responsible for crafting a way forward for this piece when collaborators are spread all over the country. And because of the multidisciplinary nature of the work, authorship does not happen except in the room with all of the ingredients and everything available, which is why when we had finally our first three performances in Nashville, um, we felt like, oh, now we see where we need to go. <laughs> now we see what the work ahead of us is because, it's, because it doesn't, the story isn't constructed in space and time until all of it is available to us. Um, which is just another challenge um, to any of us working in new work. Um, so yes, stage one is done, but lots of questions. We've already had our first uh, post-mortem to, w with everyone around the table throwing those um, big questions up for continued uh, discussion. The only thing I want to add about our dramaturgical relationship that has, that's made this I think particularly fruitful and endlessly um, fascinating for me is, you know, it took me a while to realize that you think spatially and I think temporally. And that's the intersection, I think, of building meaning um, in space uh, and why we continue to need to figure out what a shared vocabulary is. Um, because what I'm looking for in delivery on a kind of expectation in the building blocks of the piece is different from your sense of completion and vision um, in two dimensions. And I think that's uh, just a fascinating uh, aspect of a uh, dramaturgical relationship that uh, has opened um, methodological, methodological, how many syllables, methodological uh, doors in my brain that are um, eager for, um, you know, continued poking. Great. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, part of what's beautiful about the Bly grants this year is that they're all about process, and they're all engaged in the middle of it right now. Catalin, you're, uh, you're heading towards a publication, of course. Um, could you fill us in on, on the progress on the publication and your work on it? Okay. Um, I want to... <laughs> To give a bit of a bigger context before <laughs> getting there, just briefly, uh, Andre Lepetsky noted that dance has gained an increasingly catalyzing role for the arts throughout the, uh, throughout, the, throughout the second half of the 20th century and became an in inescapable force in the art scenes of the past decade. So my research builds on that and I want to bring awareness to this field of dramaturgy because I think that it can inform and informs other strands of theater making and performance. And uh, I also wanted to encourage international discourse and exchange of ideas on this subject and to further develop the vocabulary of dance dramaturgy. And uh, the, sta uh, the starting point is the rehearsal diary of the first uh, ever dance dramaturg Raimund, Raimund Hoge. He worked for the Tanztheater Wuppertal, that's Pina Bausch's dance company, and he started his career as a journalist, then he became uh, uh, the dramaturg of the company, and then later, uh, 10 years later when he left the company, he developed a career as a dancer and choreographer. But throughout that 10 years, he, he didn't give up writing and he continued working as a journalist as well. And he, he published essays and articles about the company's work, including uh, the diary 
uh, uh, documenting the way the company worked. And today we take many things for granted when we think about collaborative processes that we go into the rehearsal room and improvise and ask those questions. Well, those days Pina Bosch was experimenting with that. It, it comes in Europe, at least, it comes from her. And uh, so it's a very important piece of document. And uh, Raymond Hoger wrote about it. Uh, Bandoneon, that was the piece they were working on he, uh, in, in 1980 when he wrote this diary, documenting the work week after week. And he wrote, Bandoneon was one of my first pieces as dramaturg for Pina Bausch. And as a writer, I followed the rehearsals from the first days of the creation until the premiere of the piece in December 1980. So the aim of this project is to get this diary published in English translation. The translator is Penny Black, and the publisher is Oberon Books, and the book is coming out next April, April 2016. And uh, I was also given the opportunity to write an introductory essay to accompany the diary, uh, just to contextualize it and, and write some more about dance dramaturgy. And the research also took me, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Raymond Hoge, and I could interview him, so, uh, uh, this interview will be included in the book. Um, what, what, uh, there's one more thing I wanted to, to say that I, I really, I am very proud and happy and grateful to be a Blythe Fellow. And I took seriously what Mark thought and, and, and wrote about this, uh, this fellowship and this grant. So I thought that I should bring it back to the LMDA and the LMDA member should benefit from that. So I built in this research project a workshop where I extend my research and I invite the LMDA members to be part of this research and, and contribute to that. And we had this Dance Dramaturgy Research in Action workshop yesterday at Gibney Dance and uh, Jessica, Jess Applebaum and uh, Ari Robin, uh, Davidson, a uh, choreographer, and her three dancers helped, helped me through this journey. And it was a wonderful evening. I'm very grateful to everyone who came. I, what I'm taking away from this workshop is that it, it was wonderful to, to allow the dramaturgs to come out from the corner of the rehearsal room and fr give, offer them the dance floor. And, and and just realize that as a dramaturg, you also utilize your mind and your body when you work. And, and it was nice to, to free uh, the dramaturgs and, and nice to see how they enjoyed this freedom. And uh, the other thing that I'm going to take away from this workshop is uh, how seamlessly those people fitted in the process. They were 25 people, some of them who have never worked with a choreographer before yet in their dramaturgical toolboxes they could find tools that they could utilize. And, and that was really, really beautiful to see that choreography and dramaturgy, we share a vocabulary, and that's, this is the vocabulary I intend to further develop with my research. So thank you to all who came, and I hope that uh, the book will contribute to this discourse and, uh, and will inform contemporary theater making and performance. Great, thank you very much. Lydia, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, so Philip and I have been uh, uh, in conversation about this project for, for several months now. And uh, we're in still early phases of, uh, of the project, but we are rapidly moving towards uh, the, the more active information gathering phase of the project. Because one of the things that we realize in, in talking with each other about uh, the situations that, that we have faced in our respective institutions as, uh, as, as resident artists, as dramaturgs working in collaboration with, uh, with artists in the room, um, and, and also as staff members at institutions that are striving towards uh, putting diversity and inclusion into action, is that uh, for as many examples and, uh, and case studies as we could come up with, uh, we knew that we were only scratching at the surface. 
and and such uh, and, and 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 to the extent that we realized that we really needed to engage all of you in helping us to formulate what exactly are the questions that you are hungering to have answers for. Um, what, uh, like what is the terminology that we can uh, you know, help provide that would advance the conversation? Uh, because you know, one, one of our very earliest conversations about what um, we thought this resource would, would help to address, would answer, what I think we were talking about uh, a lot about what was happening in the rehearsal room, what's happening with the stories on stage. And the more we opened up the lens, we realized we were talking about dramaturging the entire American theater. Uh, and so how could we even begin to address that was, um, was a, big, um, a big, big question for us. Um, on a parallel track to, uh, to the, the, the project at hand, uh, this, uh, this diversity and inclusion handbook, uh, I've, also, I've also been working very closely with Carmen Morgan, um, who is about to launch uh, what she called, what, what's called the Art Equity Institute. Um, which is dedicated to, to training a cadre of, uh, of well-trained uh, facilitators across the country to talk about issues of diversity and equity uh, in arts institutions, uh, recognizing that without being able to address uh, issues of equity, um, we, we are putting our, our art form at risk, that we, you know, we cannot continue doing business as usual as the world is changing around us. And so uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be part of uh, that team of trainers, uh, along with uh, uh, Ty Defoe from Theater Communications Group, uh, Michael Robertson of The Lark, uh, and Leslie Ishii uh, from Center Theater Group, uh, alongside Carmen Morgan and Nigel Porter of Art Equity. So if you haven't yet seen information about that, uh, I absolutely encourage you to look it up. Thank you, Lydia. And just a, a couple of comments about things that you might be interested in. Recently, um, I've been writing little pieces, um, well, partly sometimes for HowlRound and, and various outlets, where I think about um, even, say, journeys like um, Ophelia's journey in Hamlet, which an actress friend of mine called the most unearned journey in the whole of Shakespeare. So she basically comes in, she's depressed, and then she kills herself. And so when we think about a diverse world, can we think about embodying Ophelia in any other way than a 19-year-old beautiful ingenue? And can we give her more of an emotional journey. So that's one question that, that people might have. How do, in other words, how do these, uh, how do I practically apply diversity? Lydia has been working for the first time at OSF with a wheeled actress. Now, um, there's the physical uh, actuality of how she gets on and off the stage. And then there's the question if there's, uh, the virtuosity of her performance can easily um, overwhelm all other considerations. So then how do we factor uh, that, uh, that actress and all of the relationships that go on around her into the overall performance? That's a really uh, fundamental and complex dramaturgical question. Um, so we really want to start being a resource for dramaturgs' questions, for um, scenarios that you may have, um, which we can, sometimes we may get several um, that are similar, which we can distill into one or two scenarios. To basically, so people, people talked a lot yesterday about fear and about, um, a lot of that has to do with um, seeming to be an expert and yet um, worrying about whether one's answer is going to be enough, is going to be alienating, is going to be too much. So that's really at the, the, the core of what we're looking to do. Um, and yeah, it's very exciting to be preparing this handbook. Uh, last little question, do you have a time frame for the completion, or at least of the f of, of first edition of it? Probably in the next six months, because we've been writing a lot of materials already 
that we're sort of banking up um, to, to put into a frame. What we really look for now in the next few months is, and also anybody who writes in will be cited. So you will be um, a part of the conversation that is formally cited in the, in, in the handbook as well. And, and that can actually be a, a form of networking for contributors. And how will be, how could anyone access it when it's released? Well, that's what we've got to talk to Beth about, um, <laughs> because it's going to be online and uh, published through the LMDA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, we, what we in, uh, in, in crafting this project, you know, one thing that we were very clear about is that uh, this is never going to have an end point. Uh, the, the, the kind of resources, the way that the discourse is developing and evolving uh, to, you know, I mean, in, in recent years, the discourse has evolved beyond race, and, you know, ethnicity and gender, for example, to start encompassing neurodiversity, to start encompassing non-normative physicality. It's, uh, I mean, even the use of, of, you know, negative language to describe a, a, a circumstance of being uh, has been a huge shift. And so, um, so using an online platform to begin also allows us enormous flexibility to continue to add materials. Um, and, and if we uh, uh, reach a point where this becomes uh, more, more of a, like, like, like a wiki project, it'd be, even, it'd be wonderful because that also in, uh, in, in, uh, in creates a sense of investment because this is something that we, all, that we want you all to feel invested in uh, to create this together. Part of what I, I think appealed uh, this project why it appealed to us was the, these, the, this group did not present themselves as experts. And that was really critical. They, they said, we are in many ways learning and we intend to invest in learning as we're doing this as well. And that this is not a set document, this is going to be an evolving document. And that actually made us feel this was worth investing in. Th that, that you know, was important because of the nature of this project. Um, sorry, d just to, to um, hog for one more second just so you have an idea of what you might write into us about. I've been recently writing a, a piece um, for a British journal on an Australian adaptation of King Lear called The Shadow King. So uh, Lear is adapted um, both linguistically and in its whole scenario against this sort of uh, red um, dust Australian background. We've got Regan sitting barefoot having sent off her drunken father, her husband's in jail. Um, and it's just, it's a magnificent production. Um, so adaptations like that, how does that fit into the conversation? Um, a lot of what artistic directors say at the moment about casting is we want to cast, uh, open up casting, open doors that were formerly closed. But then we move into the whole question of, well, what about intentional? casting, not just that um, more familiar um, colorblind model. So that's a real question that dramaturgs will have moving forward. Great. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask the same question of the ACT Lab about the accessing, um, the community accessing the information and the content you generate over the course of the next period of time. So that's the open source scalar um, model that comes out of um, uh, a big university in California. Sorry, I can't remember right now. But it can be continuously added to and, and paths can be found through it. And so it'll be an online, continuing, growing resource, open source available to all. Great. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes. Um, are there any questions uh, from the house? Anyone with questions about any of these individual projects or how you might access them. Ah, Saturday afternoon. Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with this problematic narrative notion. Could you, could you help me with that? 
Hi. Um, so in, 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 in talking about problematic narratives, and of course, you know, gi given the, like, this could be an entire conference in and of itself, um, the notion that uh, it's not enough to just have, you know, for example, let us say actors of color on a stage. The characters that they are being asked to embody, the stories they are being asked to portray, uh, also factors into what we, are, what we are perpetuating, what we are problematizing, or what we're upholding sometimes. So for example, it's not enough to say that we have a diverse acting company or a diverse ensemble on stage if the actors of color are up there playing maids, playing garden workers, uh, playing criminals, or playing characters that don't have names. It's not enough. Um, just to, to, to give you one example from OSF, and, and this was something that we own as a learning experience for ourselves in, in what happens when even we are not conscious of what we're doing. Um, we, we had a, a, a musical that we developed, uh, a beloved musical that came out of, out of a company impulse created by company artists. Um, that went on to receive a full-blown production at OSF. It was a gorgeous piece inspired by comic books. It had such verve. The, the music was incredible. Halfway through the rehearsal process, we realized, because one of the actors raised it, that the heroes of the piece were all cast by white actors, and all the actors of color on the ensemble were playing prostitutes, pimps, and villains. And, um, and as you can imagine, there was huge emotion in that rehearsal room because these were actors that were invested in the characters that were created, that, that they were creating. They were invested in the process uh, and the joy of collaboration, but there was a real heartache uh, and, and a sense of not feeling safe in, in, in raising the, have you noticed that yes, we have an incredibly diverse cast, but what are you asking us to tell? What are you asking us to portray? And so that, that issue is not, it's not unique to the theater. It is, it's happening in television, it's happening in film, and we, we all know the saying, seeing is believing. And as such, how does theater, television, and film help to perpetuate the societal problems that we are seeing play out on the streets? that we are seeing play out in political and legal policy, how laws are being carried out. It's a cycle. And as such, the way to interrupt that cycle is to be aware of it and to ask the questions. And so, and so that's what I mean by, by problematic narratives about, you know, who, who are the voices, who are the performers, what are the stories that we're telling, when are we upholding problematic stereotypes, and when are we subverting them? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. When we're doing that, how do we um, how do we mark those places while keeping the places of ambiguity that are so essential to great theatre? So we don't want to tell people, um, police, how people are staging. We want to take note of what's happening and pro still provide that ambiguity. It's a it's such a tricky thing for every dramaturg. Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions for any of our? Then I'm going to end it. Thank you on that inspiring and beautiful note. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to all of our participants. Take 15. Come back for a short and snappy AGM.